Hello everyone, today we have a special episode and as guest we have Tom from Tank and AFV News. Hello Tom. Hello. So can you tell us a little bit about your background? You have the Tank and AFV News um, blog for quite some time and since last mm -hmm. year I think also a YouTube channel. Yeah, so um, the, the Tank and AFV News website I started I think about four years ago um, and did that. It's, it's been a little on a little bit of a hiatus the last few months as I've been doing more and more of the YouTube channel. Um, you know, sort of as I go along, kind of sort of seeing what works and, and, and people, what people seem to like. And, and, and the YouTube, aside from something I, I like more doing the videos, that seems to get, be getting more attention. So, um, but in terms of uh, why I started the channel, I mean, I've been interested in tanks since I was a kid, partly um, just out of my own interests, um, partly out of uh, family background. Um, you know, it's funny, most people that get into the topic, generally it's because they're, you know, either in the military or they have family in the military. I come from a very unmilitary family, actually. But um, my father um, spent his whole career as a engineer and executive at um, what at the time was Teledyne Continental Motors, which is based out of Muskegon, Michigan. Now it's L3, but they made all the diesel engines for U.S. tanks. Um, you know, sort of for the for the patent series, so M48s, M60s. So, you know, as a kid, I used to, you know, get to go see the tank engine factory. And, um, uh, and then on, you know, family vacations, you know, my dad would take me to some of the places he'd have to go to, like Aberdeen Proving Grounds, you know, so got to see that sort of stuff. So that's sort of my background in terms of my interest of tanks. And then um, I have a, a, a bachelor's in history, so oh. just sort of historically inclined in general. So... Uh, you know, about 10 years ago, kind of for whatever reason, I just sort of really got back into the topic um, and just started collecting, uh, you know, books and, and being on forums. And after a while, I sort of wanted an outlet to sort of share some of the stuff I found and to have an excuse to talk to some of the authors and researchers on the topic. So that's sort of the genesis of uh, the website and the YouTube channel. Okay, excellent. And today we decided we talk about one of the favorite factions of World War II, namely the French and the Armour Doctrine. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, the the one video on the YouTube channel, aside from like the book reviews and some of the other short videos I do, I've been sort of trying to do a series called The Tanks of World War II, where the idea was that I would examine uh, not literally every single tank used, but the majority. And you know, I came up with a list of about 90 episodes total um, and sort of working through the war chronologically. And so right now I'm sort of doing all the French tanks. Um, so I'm still sort of working on the script right now for the the, the S35 Samoa video. But um, so it sort of got me thinking a lot about uh, French tanks and doctrine. And, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting topic because there's just not a, a ton of written about it in English compared yeah. to you know, some of the later war stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed this problem. I asked Chifton about before I did my video and books and he recommended some and basically I think two were bilingual and I think one was at least 50 bucks or something uh, on, and almost not to come by, at least also in Europe. I think in, in, in for Amazon com it was better or something. So yeah, okay. as a general, uh, a major lack of information. I think you actually are, read a bit more on it so you noticed um the french doctrine of methodical battle what can you tell us about this yeah the the methodical battle so um and i'm pulling most of this from a, a book called the seeds of disaster by uh i think his name's dowdy Do dowdy um which as far as i can tell is sort of one of the best books that that's written on the topic looking at the french doctrine and it looks even specifically at the armor doctrine but the methodical battle was sort of an outgrowth of their World War One experience. Um, so as the French sort of sat down and said, okay, you know, how are we going to fight this next war? Um, obviously, World War One played a huge uh, role in shaping their their ideas on what's going to happen in the next war. And then the methodical battle was just, um, you know, sort of came out of this idea that firepower was going to be the predominant factor on the battlefield, you know. Um, again, based on the World War One experiences that, you know, mobility was going to be pretty limited, you know, you know, the French, sort of, sort of funny, the French start world war one sort of with this idea of Elan and, you know, the attack was going to, you know, overcome everything. And instead it just led to, you know, absolutely horrendous casualty figures in 1914. Um, and so everything sort of settled down that static uh, warfare. And then, you know, they realized the only way 
offenses really worked was these very organized and methodical, you know, where you have your artillery barrage followed up by, you know, your infantry and that the tanks were there to support the infantry. Um, and while you see the doctrine change and shift, you know, in, in different periods, because, you know, we're talking about a 20 year period. So there's, you know, different yeah. things happen and different things crop up. But still, the, you know, the majority of the tanks are kept in separate tank battalions that are infantry support and are sort of designed around that infantry support model. So they're, you know, the majority of the tanks they have are the, are the, are the R35s and the, and the H35s, which are these little two man vehicles, sort of. Obviously, they're better than the old FT-17, the World War One version. But, you know, in terms of the concept, they're just an updated version on that idea of these cheap, small, two-man infantry support tanks that don't have to go much faster than the infantry because they're just there to get the infantry, you know, that X amount of meters, you know, that the artillery, the firepower is going to allow them to get to, you know. So uh, that's one of the things I think that really is shaping the French doctrine in that period is that um, they don't you know, it's, it's very different than the German experience, uh, during, during world war one, you know, the Germans are fighting on two fronts and there's much more mobility and fluidity in the, in the, in the, in, in the, the East, East, which yeah. is, you know, I mean, if you've read, uh, Satino's, uh, the German way of war, yeah, you know, yeah. any sort of theory, you know, where the French, it seems like their doctor and from war to war, it just, it's, it's, it's like, uh, going from one extreme to the other, you know, whatever happened last time, that you know they shift it to this you know the one extreme so you know prior to world war one you know it's all this you know we're gonna attack 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 constantly you know and then they realize that that especially when you're wearing red pants doesn't help very well <laughs> when you're up against machine guns um so you know the, the post-world war one doctrine is this, this very you know not defensive although it definitely installed a really sort of a, a, a defensive mindset in the whole french system and also just you know the thing though that i find most fascinating about that french 1940 campaign is you can find so many different things that are wrong that the french do wrong but not it's really hard to point to the one thing that's yeah. like oh it was this it was that no it's just the combination of them all so yeah yeah it's it's uh, i mean i if you i know did you read um from karl heinz Frieser blitzkrieg le legend The um, Blitzkrieg Legend. The by, who is the author? Freezer. No, I don't think I, I've I've read that one. Because this, this is a, um, a German author, and he looked at the French and the, the German um, documents and archives, and and a lot of times, basically, the the sub chapter titles are um, the French try counterattack, with the emphasis on try. Like it's yeah. it's like every time there and and it goes wrong and communication problems and and many other aspects was as Chifton noted for the S thirty five that they had two tanks in there, fuel tanks mm -hmm. and and yeah. most of them didn't know and they only filled up the upper one and it's like okay yeah they didn't even know how to fill the tank properly with fuel so you see this this training period and everything going on. Mm -hmm. What did you encounter anything about um, what the French drew lessons from the Spanish Civil War? Because I can only remember that the French looked at the German tanks in the Spanish Civil War and they noted, yeah, well, they are no match for our tanks. And yeah, I'd have to go back. I don't know if there's anything specific that they mentioned. You know, the thing about the Spanish Civil War, as you know, like there, there really were no good. Um, sort of doctrinal lessons to be learned because, you know, the fighting was, you know, for the most part, sort of smaller actions. Most of the tank actions didn't involve enough tanks to really draw a lot of lessons other than technical ones, which, yeah, basically was that everybody realized their tanks were too thinly armored. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I have to go back and see what the French, but I would assume, yeah, probably they just figured like, yeah, our tanks, because, you know, that's the thing about the French tanks, you know, like that on that very basic level, of the Trinity, you know, and you did that, uh, you know, there was, uh, armor protection, speed, yeah. and firepower. Yeah. Yeah. because he did that video with, um, Oh, what's his name? The fellow over at the, the Munster museum, Ralf Ratz, the director. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, and you guys, you know, you covered all this stuff, but yeah, there's these, those basic stats, but they don't really tell you a lot in terms of, 
actual effectiveness, you know, because there's so many other factors beyond just that armor, firepower, and mobility. So those, those raw stats. And, um, you know, the one thing I think, yeah, with the, with the French campaign that doesn't get enough attention, but like that, like the chieftain touched on with that story about the gas tanks and, um, you know, some other, you know, the people who have written on a note is a lot of it's just a basic, it's just basic competence. It's not even about like who's got the better doctrine or the better vehicles. It's just that the Germans know what they're doing. They've had practice, you know, the, the German armored forces, you know, they had, they got practice and, you know, during the Anschluss when, or is that how you say it? Anschluss. You know, when they yeah. And, yeah. And, and, you know even, even though there's no fighting, just the fact that they had, were able to move a couple armored divisions a couple hundred miles and just sort of get used to moving large scale formations. Yeah. You know, and then of course, Poland, obviously. Um, so the, the Germans are competent and the French tank forces and uh, frankly, a lot of them aren't. And I'm not saying that to be nasty because. Yeah. They, 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 you know, they just lack the experience because this was what some people don't get the Anschluss. They said, Oh yeah. Okay. You, you drove a, a few tank divisions to Linz uh, and Vienna. Yeah. And, and some people say, yeah, but you didn't, didn't saw action. Yeah. But that's, already way more than anyone else did because everyone else uh, basically moved to the maneuver side once a year or something mm -hmm. and uh, or drove around with a, with a company of tanks at best usually a small unit or something and they moved the whole the whole uh, full, whole freaking division and then they yeah. broke down they had like i think they had various problems like i think the fuel for instance that they, f they had to use fuel from the gas stations And then Austria was actually driving on the other side of the road, so they had more accidents. And they realized, oh, damn it, we have way more breakdowns in our tanks, so we need more more maintenance companies, and we need more competence. And also, people learned then how to get their tank running again if it broke down. Yeah. So improvisation, which which at this point is improvisation. And then in 1940, what was what was like for, let's say for some guys, it was improvisation in 1938. In 1940, they already knew, knew what to do if something broke down, for mm -hmm. instance. Whereas the French basically learned from a new, okay, we didn't, we didn't even know how to fill the, the fuel tanks at this yeah. point is for the French. And the Germans at this point is like, okay, I was trained on the Panzer one, I was trained on the Panzer two. I'm now sitting in a Panzer three or four. Yeah. And, you know, it's, um, I think like some of those, uh, the, the Sharp, Sharp B1 Bist crews, like literally had gotten their tanks, uh, you know, a matter of days before the war started, some of those units. I mean, so there's a lot of French units, particularly the ones with the best tanks that are in a state of transition, uh -huh. you know, so they're still getting used to the equipment. And, um, you know, it's interesting, I, 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 on my side, I did a couple different um, uh, phone interviews with, with Steven's Logan and typed them out into a a transcript and we talked about the French stuff a little bit and he said, you know, some of the stuff he found was just like, like really practical matters that you wouldn't think about, but like in the battlefield, like the French were just having trouble, like they could get the fuel to the tanks. The problem was getting the fuel into the tanks, like, you know, and I don't even know like what exactly the issue was, you know, but it was some sort of just really basic, uh, you know, sort of figuring out how to do this thing in, in practical terms. You know, and of course, you know, the Germans had already figured this out because they, yeah. they'd been in the field, you know. Um, so like, yeah, those, those, those training questions, you know, and I, you know, people don't, don't realize like it's to do the kind of mass maneuvers, you know, to, to train the troops on this stuff. It's a very expensive proposition. And, you know, in the 1930s, a lot of these countries are not interested in spending that kind of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have, you have this problem all the time in mean, the, the naval, uh, the Washington naval treaties, for instance, in 19, uh, 22 were also influenced by this because they were like, okay, we need to build big ships and then we can't afford this. Okay, let's make a naval treaty to, to limit everything down that we, we can save money yeah. basically, but, but nobody else can, can build up major forces as well. So, and, and the similar aspect happened with all the tank forces. I mean, you see the same with, with the tor torpedoes, for instance, that all All countries went into war with really bad submarine torpedoes, except I think the Japanese, but everyone else is like, okay, we need to save money. Don't shoot a, a live one. Really? Mm -hmm. Don't yeah. shoot a live torpedo? Like, okay, well, mm -hmm. then we don't do this or once in 10 years or something. You know, it's, it's sort of similar, sort of in the more modern era, you know, I've read stuff where like, you know, everybody talks about anti-tank guided missiles and, and, you know, how potentially effective they are. But in a lot of armies, like, Troops never get to fire one because they're they're not cheap. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like a guided missile is not cheap. You're not going to just let guys shoot off a bunch of them just to get good at it. So, 
Um, you know, sort of always have to wonder if, if in the Cold War things had suddenly heated up, how effective those would have been. Because you know, do these guys actually know how to use them? It's, you know, it's hard to say. But um, back to you know, you mentioned you know, it's funny the naval weight treaties. There was a weight issue for tanks. It affected French tank development. Um, in the 30s, there was, and you know, I don't have notes. I forgot the the name of the specific uh, treaty they're looking at, but there was one they were working on that might have limited tanks to 20 tons. Mm. Um, so the French, who were trying to develop, you know, they had their light tanks, which were the the the, the two man infantry support jobs, you know, and some of the reconnaissance uh, types, but they wanted a, a medium tank or a battle tank, you know, and so they had the 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 the, the B1 bis which is clearly over 20 tons. That's like closer to 30, you know, so they develop it. They're like, well, we're not sure we're going to actually be able to use it if this treaty goes through. So, you know, the backup plan was the, the, the D two, um, which was a tank that really didn't get produced in large numbers, but is mostly well known because that's what Charles de Gaulle's unit, uh, had during the battle of France. So, but yeah, so, uh, you know, it's kind of funny that you don't think of, weight restrictions on tanks but that was an issue some of those disarmament uh, uh treaties of the 30s i only know that um that the germans also had some weight restrictions because for for uh, for bridges were quite some violent then at mm -hmm. one point they scratched it but i think it was 12 tons or something i remember chief they mentioned it but i never read it so i'm, I'm always not, not entirely sure here Talonga mentions actually several um myths and legends about the 1940 campaign that uh, the French, for instance, deployed them in penny packets. So, yeah. so what, what is your thought on this? Yeah, you know, that's, that's one of the interesting things. And, um, you know, organization of units, I think, is one of those things that never gets enough attention in, in books because it's sort of a little more, you know, it's not nearly as, 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 as attention grabbing as talking about the tanks themselves. Yeah, so yeah, I, I know. <laughs> marketing part, you know, a book of like, French tank organization of 1940 is probably not going to fly off the shelves. But yeah, I mean, the French, yeah, the famous quote is, and I, I, one of the famous French generals or politicians sort of, you know, their excuse of why they lost the campaign is like, well, we had our tanks organized in, uh, you know, a thousand groups of three, and they had theirs organized in three groups of a thousand. There's a, there's a kernel of truth to that, but it's, 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 it's a real simplification. Um, the, the success of the, the Germans wasn't because they had their tanks massed into huge units like that's not the key like lots of people actually everybody was doing that yeah, in that yeah. Period. you know the russians were doing that with these huge all tank formations and they just got destroyed you know a year later in barbarossa you know the key of the german success was that the panzer divisions were a balanced combined arms unit yeah that exactly yeah. operated but they did have you know the truth is they did have all their tanks concentrated in those 10 panzer divisions um you know the french had i think uh, again, I don't have notes in front of me, but you know, they had, they had a couple different things, close armored divisions. I remember Citino mentioning something that the French had two different kind of formations and one he noted, I think was too slow and the other one didn't have enough punch. Yeah. Um, they, they had the, um, the DLMs and the, I think the DCR and uh, don't ask me to pronounce them because French is not my, uh, yeah, I noticed, I, I know the problem. <laughs> One, one, both of them lacked um, infantry and artillery support to the degree that the German Panzer divisions did, which yeah. is sort of like everybody had that issue. You know, the bigger problem with with the with the French mechanized divisions, they were in the wrong place. You know, they're all mostly um, stationed, you know, further up north because you know they're sort of anticipating, you know, a repeat of the the, the Schlieffen plan. You know, where the the offense is coming through the Low Countries there. Um, so, you know, they've got their best units stationed up there to sort of reach, for, you know, rush forward to, uh, you know, was it the Doyle line, I think, was sort of where they were planning to to make their big stand. And so it's sort of in that part where you get some of those, um, you know, interesting uh, tank battles, you know, which, you know, Zaloga wrote about a couple of those in that the Osprey Duel series, the, the S-35 versus Panzer III and uh, Char B-1 Bis versus Panzer IV. But you know those units aren't aren't there where the where the actual uh, main offensive through the Ardennes is coming. So uh, that's the biggest problem with the French armored units is they're in the wrong location partially. Um, but then yeah, the bulk of the French tank force is in separate battalions. You know that are intended for infantry support that are assigned. You know at the, at the sort of core army level and then you know attached to infantry divisions for specific tasks. And that's um, 
you know, the funny thing, people always act like that's, that's like the wrong thing to do, but it's, as the war progresses, you see every army moves toward sort of a mix. So, you know, for example, the U S army in 1944, about half of our tank battalions were a little over half are part of the armored divisions. You know, the rest are assigned to the infantry divisions, you know, just as independent tank battalions, because, you know, those infantry divisions, they need some sort of armored support or else they have basically no offensive capabilities. Um, in a situation like World War II. So, you know, now obviously, the, you know, the British do the same thing. They have their, their cruiser tanks and their infantry tanks. Um, and even the Germans, you know, so at the beginning of the war, the idea, you know, supposedly that Guderian uh, was insistent that all tanks be part of the Panzer Division's Panzer Force. You know, and then they're like, well, the infantry needs something. So, you know, instead of coming up with an infantry tank, they come up with the, 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 the Stug, which is, it's a totally different concept. On paper, it's supposed to be artillery, but it's the sort of armored mobile firepower for the infantry. So, yeah, I mean, the Stuck goes it, back basically to World War One, and it, and and the final thing was basically a memorandum from Rumanstein, I think, when he was back a colonel. Now, actually, I read what what Zaloga brought up about this and about that it more developed in the in the time of the war for more these separate battalions and everything. And I'm, I'm kind of torn because I'm not entirely sure if you can compare it with 1940. Because mm. first of, U.S. Army, well, let's face it, you you had you had so many Shermans, you could yeah. stuff them everywhere. Okay, this is the this is the one thing. The same with with the Soviets. So they had plenty of units. And the other aspect is, for instance, in 1940. You, uh, an anti-tank gun was still portable, had a tactical mobility even with infantry on it. Whereas in mm. 1944, you couldn't have an anti-tank gun, which was basically had tactical mobility on the field. So you need itself propelled anti-tank guns or tanks mm. or, or Stuks, whatever, for, for even for the infantry divisions, usually in anti-tank capabilities. <coughs> so I'm... I, I'm a bit. I'm not entirely sure because Zaloga wrote this in, in the book in um, French Tanks of World War Two, Part Two, and and he mentions it a bit as a counter, but he doesn't really explain or goes into depth. So it, it so I I could say well I I really would need to look at the at the organizations and also how the German divisions changed, and for for the Germans they have always the the Schwerpunkt. The, the mm. main point of effort or, or center of gravity, it gets translated, I think, in three different ways. And and they put usually most of the tanks there. And, and similarly, I mean, they also had quite many infantry in their in panzer divisions. But as like, as you mentioned before, every armored division had not enough in the beginning of the war. This was, they, they yeah. were constantly running out of, of infantry because you know, the squish, squishy guys and the tank crews usually survive and also the tanks. So I'm, I'm not so entirely sure if, for instance, if you actually can compare it with late war. So for 1940, mm -hmm. and of course, the other argument you could make is what Wilbeck brought up in, the, in, in his book or his thesis about the Tiger tanks, that for defense he, he realized or he noted that it seems that it was more effective to use the, the Tigers in a dispersed fashion. And not in a concentrated mm -hmm. fashion as for the attack. So actually in this case, it might actually have made sense to to use the French tanks more independently and to support the infantry and everything for a defensive action. But for the offensive, yeah. I mean it also depends, for instance, the Germans I think mostly attacked with the with the armored formation. I don't know exactly how the, the US Army and everyone else um conducted the war in 1944 so this might also be in this particular instance different that they say okay we use different units for attacking and then it actually makes sense to have okay most tanks in 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 the divisions and for the others the other way around so it it's i'm not entirely sure if if the point is okay everyone else developed over the war um more uh used more tanks with infantry units as well mm -hmm. I, it could be because yeah. he, 
he, he just mentioned it a short while and so it, it could be it could be perfectly fine and I'm wrong but it could also be the other way around that okay if you look into the detail and the organization and the doctrine and everything of the armies that actually actually no this is not uh, not so valid yeah I mean it's I, German army 1940 definitely is sort of the extreme case of all of their armors in the armored units um, you know because I think you know Stug production at that point was I think they had a, I think they had one battery or three batteries yeah. or something, and I think they were attached so, to one elite uh, army division or something. Mm -hmm. So you know, we do see as the war goes on, the German army you get you do see an increase in 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 armored vehicles that are being put into separate battalions. You know, and it's usually not tanks. The tanks still are all in the Panzer divisions, but yeah. you know the various the tank destroyers and, and the Jag Panzers and the heavy tanks. And, you know, it's, it's funny because every army sort of comes with doctrines and what they think stuff should be used for them. When you actually get in the field, you know, a lot of times these assault guns are being used as tank. I mean, if you're a guy in the field and you're fighting a battle and it's like, okay, here's a big thing with tracks and a gun and armor and we need a tank right now, it's going to get forced in that role, you know. And I think that's the other lesson of the war is that there, there was just too much over-specialization, you know. In most situations, you just needed a good tank. You didn't need a... You know, in the U.S. Army, we see that with the whole tank destroyer doctrine, which was quickly discarded. And, you know, the British quickly realized, like, we just need a universal tank. We don't need, you know, these... Uh, cruiser and, and infantry tanks. Cruiser, yeah. Act actually, something comes to mind, which I think I read both for the U.S. Army and the Germans. There was one major problem um, that quite often infantry didn't advance if there wasn't, weren't tanks nearby. And mm -hmm. this actually created quite a problem, for instance, for the Germans, um, that, for instance, the Sturks, yeah, were like, they were fighting from behind because, well, to use the armor protection, but the infantry was not moving forward. So the Sturks had to move forward to be close to the infantry that the infantry would advance again, but then they mm -hmm. would put the Sturks or the, the Panthers in danger. And I think I read something similar that quite often U.S. Army forces were also, or the infantry were quite reluctant to move forward if the tanks were not close by. So this yeah. actually could have could have been related to something like that for more more like a, a moral support and less of a firepower mm. support, or ba basically both. But but for 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 this kind of stuff. So this would be interesting if this actually might have influenced. The decision or the organizational setup here. Yeah, and it's always funny, you know, when doctrine has to sort of face the realities of what any particular military is facing, how roles change. So, you know, as you see during the war, the Stugs become used more and more as tank destroyers. Yeah. Because that's what the Germans need. Whereas in the US Army, the tank destroyers are being used more and more essentially as assault guns, you know, because every, not every, but, you know, Many of the U.S. infantry divisions fighting to Europe, they would get assigned, you know, uh, it's a lot of times like an entire U.S. tank battalion, an independent tank battalion, and a tank destroyer battalion. Because, you know, you know the tank, U.S. tank destroyer, the, the idea is they're supposed to be held in reserve and then used, rushed toward any sort of armored, uh, you know, penetration in the lines and stop it. You know, that was sort of the American response to, to the events of 1940. They were like, well, how do we stop this? You know, because they were sort of buying into that idea of, the Germans won because they had just massive numbers of tanks concentrated in a narrow front, which, yeah, that, that was, that was part of it, but that's like not the whole story, but you know, they were like, well, you know, how do we, we are never going to be like the infantry units are never going to have enough organic anti-tank firepower to stop that kind of concentrated tank attack. So we need something to counter it. So they come up with this tank destroyer concept and it makes sense that, you know, the U S army, they're trying to come up with a solution to a problem as they see it. The thing is, like, in 1944, when you're on the attack, it's kind of silly to have these battalions that are equipped and are just sort of supposed to be held in reserve just in case. You know, so, you know, everybody's like, well, you know, they look like tanks, give them to the infantry, you know, assign them to the infantry, and they get used essentially as sometimes as self-propelled artillery, uh, you know, even doing indirect fire missions, but a lot of times as assault guns. So when... um. So Leslie McNair was head of Army Ground Forces, and he was, he was an artillery man by nature, and he looked at the tank destroyers, and he said, you know, these things are pretty expensive. Wouldn't it be more cost-effective to use a towed gun in that role? You know, and they tried to do that. Partly, they picked a pretty rotten gun, which is the U.S. 76-millimeter anti-tank gun, because it was, um, they just slapped a three-inch gun on, on the 105-millimeter howitzer carriage, which made it just a really tall and heavy 
piece of equipment. But the bigger issue was that the infantry looked at that and, and they're like, no, we want those things that look like tanks because, you know, they can help, you know, help us, help us, you know, shoot our way into the, into the, in, into the, wherever we're trying to go, you know, cause they're mobile and have armor, not a great amount of armor. You know, these U S tank destroyers, they're really not well suited to that role of assault gun, but you know, that's what they got used for because that was the need and this is what's on hand, you know? So, yeah, I mean, you know, this is also influenced by, by the change of the, the situation because the Sturks basically were made for attack, but then they are mm -hmm. fighting anti-tank role because this Germany is not a strategic defense. Whereas the yeah. tank destroyer concept seems more defensive. But yeah, the Germans are not really attacking anymore, but we are attacking. So yeah, let's lose the tank destroyers as assault guns or supporting the infantry, basically. Because so, so it's... The intended role, well, didn't account for the strategic change sometimes, I guess, or what would what be happening. So you could say actually yeah. they were intended correctly, but yeah, mm -hmm. the, the war changed in, in a few years, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, the other thing to note with the Stug is just that it was a really excellent vehicle. Uh, you know, part of the reason, you know, they produced so many and it, it was, they, I think, you know, relied on it so much. Um, you know, for these sort of missions is because it was just a very good tool. It was one of their best armored vehicles by far and certainly one of the most successful. And, you know, it's funny because it's not a particularly glamorous one. It's, it, you know, it's not like a King Tiger where it just, you know, is this imposing, cool looking thing, but it just, it, it worked. It was sort of the right size for what armies at that point could maintain in the field. Um, you know, so yeah, I'm a big fan of the Stug. It's, it's, probably my favorite of the german vehicles i think well i, yeah, I don't think you can see it right now i think it's over on this shelf behind me but, ah yeah yeah yeah, yeah so, I, mean, I mean the stork was was basically i mean it was also very reliable because it was built on the panzer free chassis so they had a lot of experience with it in in the long run so this is also what what some people forget that when they look at at, at tiger and pant and say oh they were really unreliable yeah, um, you don't want to look at the first Panzer Three or Panzer Four. <laughs> they are probably not so reliable as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny, you know. You know, with German stuff, at least what's published in English, um, so much of it's based, you know, looking at the later war tanks because those capture the imagination. I admit, when I was a kid, like a teenager, those are the first models I I, I didn't go like rushing to the store to buy a model of a Panzer Two. I wanted a model of a Panther, you know, yeah. it's cool, you know, but, um, all the German successes were with these really not terribly impressive vehicles. Mostly you know, with like, the Panzer one actually. Because... <laughs> yeah. You know, Panzer ones and twos. And, um, you know, although, you know, it's funny, I did the video on the Panzer one and, um, it's a pretty nice little design compared to like the tank ads of everyone else, you know, and that's essentially, it's a tank ad. It's not even a light tank. I mean, it's in that same weight class. It's armed with, you know, a couple of machine guns, but um, it, it, you, you can't be too critical of it for, you know, especially for that, that's sort of their first design where they're trying to establish their own tank industry and come up with something like, you know, what's something that'll be useful that we can start producing just to, you know, get that practice at producing vehicles. So um yeah, don't let don't ever let people make fun of the Panzer One. You know, obviously not. You know, it, it 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 was a very important vehicle, even if it wasn't a particularly impressive vehicle. I guess I'd put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the Panzer One. I, I saw recently one at the Panzer Museum, and it's like I standing in front of it and I and like, yeah. But what do I do against this little bugger if I only have a rifle? And it's like, yeah. oh, it has two machine guns. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, okay, uh, uh, this thing is small, but it's it's still well armored, and everything, uh, and it has a turret with two machine guns in it, and it comes in packs of five at least. Okay, that's that's ten machine guns. <laughs> it this is not this is a lot of firepower basically on a on, on a very fast and also since it's rather small, it's not too easy to hit it, neither. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> and, and this is the thing uh, what, which I realized when I did the video, the S-35 against the Panzer IV. And if you look at German tanks and French tanks, what my general impression is kind of is like the French tanks were basically all interwar designs. 
Mm-hmm. Whereas the German tanks were basically early World War II designs. You, you, yeah. If you look at them, they, you just see they look way more modern. The German one, the, even the Panzer one, the Panzer two, the Panzer three and four. And for for the French, it's still like weird boxes, very small turret in, in comparison mm-hmm. to the, the hull turret ratio is extreme usually. So you have this yeah. very small turret, usually one man or one and a one and a half man turret. And, and and also, even if you look at the tracks, if you look at the tracks, it look basically like World War II tracks usually. Whereas the Germans, you look at it, oh, well, this is very finicky, complicated looking in comparison to the to the French, well, basically welded plates or, or, or molded plates. Like, And then you, you say, kind of, okay, this yeah. is kind of weird. Yeah, the, the, it's funny, the French tanks... The the Char B one bis is 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 certainly the one that's because that's like sort of the development goes all the way back to like the 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 twenties um, and it just took them forever to develop that and it it definitely has it, actually that's one of my favorite tanks too of the war because it's just so weird I, I have a weird uh, any any of the the the, the tanks that have um, multiple guns like the M three Lee I just think are there's just something inherently cool about them even if it's not a good idea <laughs> but. Yeah, that that Char that Char one business definitely has a World War One look to it. I mean, yeah. you got the tracks all the way around that one in particular. But some of the other vehicles that were really common in that in in, uh, in 1940 were 1930 designs and mid 30 designs. You know, it's just the French had sort of certain ideas uh, again, like partly having to do with um, uh, financial reasons. Some of it's like sort of industrial, what we can build. So yeah, they just really thought that that one man turret was a good idea, which obviously it wasn't. Um, but you know, and then like those little two man tanks, and they were like, well, you know, in the last war we were at a manpower disadvantage versus you know against the Germans. Um, it's really important that we have uh, we don't we don't want a three man tank for this sort of infantry support role because they they had the D D one and D two, which were three men. They're like they were like issued a new. Uh, Requirements say no. We want something that will re- basically be the size of the old FT to do that two-man role because it's it's efficient from a manpower standpoint. And you know maybe if you're getting a protracted war, that's an issue. But you know in the war, like you know, what's the point of of intentionally having a, a more limited tank for the sake of saving manpower if it means that you know your tanks aren't going to be as good? And it might be a contributing factor in losing in two months. So. But yeah, the, 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 and of course they kept for the sake of sort of economy, like wanted to sort of use the same turret over multiple platforms. Well, if that basic turret that you've picked is kind of crappy, that's kind of mean all your tanks are going to have that same limitation. So, um, so all those little infantry tanks have that, that same turret. It's a one man turret. It's, you know, that, that third, you know, the other thing we, you know, you can pick on the Panzer one for having two machine guns, but how is that any worse than that short barreled 37 millimeter gun that's on? The uh, uh, the R thirty five and the H thirty five. It's a World War One leftover. They literally took them out of the old FT tanks and put them in these new tanks to save money. You know, and and from what I've read, the thing it's it, they people compare it uh, basically to like a modern like forty millimeter grenade launcher in terms of lethality. Although they said it's not as good. So you've got a you know a, a, along with a you know magazine fed machine gun, you've got a tank that's basically got the firepower of a modern U.S. infantryman who's carrying a you know, assault rifle grenade launcher combo. That's that's not very impressive. Um, so, so yeah, every time you look, you're like, oh, well, all their tanks had cannons. It's like, yeah, but those 37 millimeter guns, they don't, you know, especially if you go back and read in like in World War One, the, the infantry version of it, because it was, just, you know, sort of came from the infantry gun. And those were not popular. They weren't effective. So... I think that's a very good point, but uh, when you mentioned that there were, many were designed in the 30s, but a lot of reuse happened. And this is the difference mm-hmm. to the German. They didn't have anything to reuse because they had, they had no tanks, they had to build them from scratch. So so they de- designed them quite differently and more intentionally or were less shackled. I mean, this, this is the same for, with all the other weapons they had. Since due to Versailles, they had to basically throw everything away or it was destroyed or whatever or given to the Allies or, yeah, and taught. They, they had to design everything new, which also meant that quite many times it was just more modern because it was designed from the ground up and not mm-hmm. from existing um, 
structures because quite many later you will see this again and again for instance even with the also with the US torpedoes they had the same problem they used um, existing parts which worked in the previous torpedo but since the new torpedo was way faster everything broke just because the the velocity and everything goes up and then you have square two you do formulas and yeah suddenly no, nothing works anymore and if you design everything from scratch you you take another uh, approach to it and mm -hmm. similarly, the Germans, to a certain degree, also let develop stuff in, in Austria and in Switzerland and everyone else. So they had also quite the competencies there. And yeah, they also had quite a lot of experience in building weapons. Yeah, and, you know, it's sort of a sidetrack, but, you know, one, another thing and sort of that idea of um, tank development in that period that sort of gets overlooked is, is engines. And this is sort of one thing that I... I Kind of harp on a bit and it probably has to do with just my own background of you know my, my introduction to tanks was my dad's job which was all around engines you know and it, it, it's a really underrated point because the thing about engines is they're probably the most of all the different components in a tank they have the longest development period you know it takes they're complicated it takes a long time to develop one you know guns are or you look at gun development it happens much faster than engines so World War II, everybody's sort of fighting the war with the engines that they have. You know, and the Germans have the advantage of that they had actually put aside, you know, Maybox developing engines specifically for use in tanks. Um, so they've got some good engines, you know, um, uh, and, you know, I'm blanking on designations, but, the, you know, the, the engine of the Panzer three and four, it's intended for tanks. They're not trying to, you know, take an airplane engine and convert it, you know, and then later they have the HL-230, which is, you know, powering... You know, the reason they can have those big, heavy cats is because they've got a decent, very compact, made for that purpose, 600, 700 horsepower engine, depending on how they've got it governed, you know. Um, everybody else, in particular the Western Allies, is sort of scrambling. So, you know, you look at the French tanks in 1930, and it's sort of like, you know, Renault or Hotchkiss, they're just sort of looking around and finding an engine and throw it in there. And, you know, even if they had wanted to make something bigger and more impressive, they probably didn't have an engine to power the, the, the thing, you know, so... Or the British, you know, have spent half the war messing around with old Liberty engines, which is, yeah, it was a great engine when it was designed in World War One. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, in the U.S. with the Sherman, I mean, you know, it's a fantastic story. I love the Sherman tank, you know, and all the different crazy engines we had to put into that thing. But, you know, we're running radial airplane engines. Like, so, that you know, that, that when you look at the success of, say, you know, German tank design or Soviet tank design, partly it's based on the fact that they've got a good engine to start with. The Soviets have the V2, the 500 horsepower diesel, um, you know, it's not perfect, it's, it, but it was a, a great basis for them to move forward, you know, because the, the tank, tank engines are, you know, this is one of the things I just, you know, my dad used to talk about. They have no civilian application. Oh, They're okay. The, a tank engine has to be designed for tanks. You can't just take an, another engine off the shelf, you know. You look at the other engines that are in that power category, you know, we're talking about like trains, boats. They don't have the same weight and space restrictions. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you know the other thing is tank engines are incredibly expensive. So I think like uh, you know the plant he used to work at, which you know they're still making uh, AVDS seventeen nineties. At last he told me you know they're up to like four hundred thousand dollars a piece. You know, so <laughs> they're they're not cheap. So so yeah, that's the thing. If if you don't invest in sort of that tank engine development early, you know, because it takes a while to develop one. You're not going to have a decent one, and then you're scrambling, and you're you know throwing a couple of bus diesels into the back of your infantry tank, you know, like the Matilda, and the thing goes 12 miles an hour. So, so a bit of a tangent, but that's that's one of the things I think that the Germans did right is they had, um, you know, Maybach had some very decent engines, so they weren't constantly having to figure out, you know, throwing a couple, you know, all these crazy things that the Western Allies are doing to power tanks of the right size. And it's a very interesting point. I wasn't really aware of that. I, I was a bit aware about the, the whole diesel discussion and, and what was going on, that the Germany wasn't cap capable of producing a proper diesel engine at yeah. this point because they were, a they were quite good with the, with the petrol engines. But I wasn't aware that the Germans actually had uh, a leading edge there in, in tank engines. And also, yeah, it makes sense that there's no civilian civilian application for a tank engine now we have the power to weight ratio and everything yeah 
Good. I mean, and, and I, I say that like once you're getting into the, the the weight range of more modern tanks. Obviously, when we're talking about like early war stuff, where you got you know a ten ton light tank. Yeah, yeah you, you can, can have a tractor. Yeah, you can out, you know. But it's yeah, once you're getting into the sort of the, 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 or even just the mediums, you know, like that thirty ton range that's uh, sort of become the norm, sort of halfway through the war. Yeah. So, and you know, it's funny. I haven't really. I don't think anybody. You should do a video on has, this. Yeah, and, and it, it takes some research because, like most, like again, most of the books you read on tanks, they really focus on, you know, firepower. You know, you get, you know, people have published entire books of just like compendium of of armor penetration stats for guns. Yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> but he has a book of like engine stats. You know, sometimes this can be pretty hard to find this information. Um, so I just think engines are one of those sort of somewhat neglected things. You know, and and. You know, it's funny, there's the famous Guderian quote, and I, I don't remember exactly, you know, where he says, yeah. you know, sort of important weapon of a panzer is the engine, which yeah, um, there's some truth to that. And, you know, I hate to quote Guderian because he's sort of such a... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a quite problematic character. <laughs> <laughs> he gets enough attention as it is. I'll just leave it at that. And, uh, uh, it, the, recently, I was at a conference as a guest, not as a speaker, And and uh, the current leading military historian on, on tank warfare or tanks in general, uh, Markus Perlman, gave a talk. And and somebody later asked, because Guderian wrote that and that in about that and that, and and Perlman at first addressed, he said, you know, uh, I wrote you know this book about it, and, and I had to intensively um, take a look at Guderian and everything. And in general, don't trust anything he wrote down. He did, he did some very important stuff for German tank development and everything. But what he wrote, be very careful about it because there's nearly all the time an intention behind it. He also, Pullman also noted that basically the book Achtung Panzer uh, Guderian wrote was basically a PR piece. This yeah. was not a tactical or doctrinal stuff. This was basically a, a PR piece. He wrote for politicians and the civilians to get the tanks going. So, so in, in many aspects that sometimes Guderian had very specific intention when he said something or wrote something. And I think um, Ralf Ratz also noted to me this one author, I don't know who, who wrote, I think, a book or I think it was a paper on the very different versions, I think, of, of um, Panzerlieder, the memoirs of Guderian, mm -hmm. and that he changed something every time around and differently yeah. and and that's quite interesting and i i need to look at marcus perlman's book again if he what he included on the engines this would be really interesting because mm -hmm. i now that you pointed out this to me i will be more careful to look about engine stuff because i know previously i probably also ignored it because i never thought about it but now it's like okay engines And and for me it was always for me it always what I looked at was was radios basically mm -hmm. communications is is the the aspect which got mostly ignored because the Germans had very good signal troops and especially also in the tanks and most people don't care about this but yeah if you're on the battlefield or or behind the battlefield without communications nothing happens but the engines yeah it's more tank specific. More on the technical side, and and I neglected that way too much. I think, yeah, good yeah. point. Yeah, you, you mentioned radios, and that's a huge factor in 1940. Um, you know, the French really just didn't. Uh, you know, they're really still tied to to telephones as the primary communication system, which you know may work when you're in a static trench situation in 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 World War One, when you're in a much more fluid battlefield uh, like 1940. It, Rely on telephones and bicycle couriers or whatever is 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 not ideal, um, you know. So a lot of the French tanks don't have radios, and even if they did, it's it's hard to imagine them being used effectively when you've got a one man turret and your commander is trying to command, load the gun, fire the gun. Yeah, you know, he's also supposed to use a radio, and at the same time, he doesn't even have a hatch on the top of the turret that he can stick his head out and look. You know, that's the other thing about the French tanks that like. I have such a hard time getting my head around and I'm sure you've seen the chieftain videos on it, you know, and yeah. he talks about it, but yeah, the only hatch is that like door on the back of the turret. So in order to see out, he sort of has to open that and put most of his torso outside the turret. Yeah. You know, it's not something you want to do in the middle of a battle. And, uh, you know, why they didn't have a hatch on the top of the vehicle. I don't, 
it would be interesting. And I don't know of anybody who sort of really dug into the French records and figured that out, or if they have, it hasn't been in, published in English because of. Yeah, that's an interesting that, question. You know, and that's across all of the tanks because they kept using the same. You know, they basically have the smaller turret that's on all the the, the two man tanks, and then they have the the slightly larger one of the forty seven millimeter gun that's on the the S thirty five and the Char B. Um, or at least, you know, similar versions of that. And, uh, you know, the other interesting thing, you know, but the French had some interesting stuff. So, like, in terms of technology, the Sharp one bis has an absolutely amazing transmission um, because it has to, because to aim the hull gun, the driver has to very be able yeah. to, to rotate that turret very, very carefully because there's no there's no traverse on it, which is another one of those decisions. Um, you know, another thing about the the the, the Sharp one and question that always pops in my mind when I looked at it, and I've asked a few people and, and nobody's really been able to give me a good answer is that 75 millimeter gun if you look at it why is the the the, the walls on that gun so thick it looks like a medieval cannon yeah <laughs> yeah I think it's rather old one I assume yeah. but the, like the so. thing is that the the tank is pretty fast I saw it in Boeing driving around and put it in, in my video and and like Chifton looked at me and I said eh, that's way faster than I suspected, and and for me it was the same. It, it 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 kept up with the others, and actually it looked probably due to its size, it actually looked faster than most of the other tanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, and I I haven't uh, like I said, I haven't gotten to that one yet in my series, so I haven't really like dug through all the materials, and uh, uh, but but still, you know, it, the few that managed to get to the battlefield were pretty effective for the yeah. most part. The problem is, you know, uh, you know, a lot of them broke down on the way or, you know, they're, they're having real logistical issues with those vehicles because those were like brand, you know, it's a funny thing. This, is, this vehicle looks like it's from the 1920s, but they're not actually getting them out into the field until that year, you know. So, you know, that's the funny thing with the French tanks. It's, it, it, it's not so much that the tanks themselves are old. It's more that they're designed and built around outdated ideas. Um, because, like I say, most of the tanks are produced like in the in the couple of years leading up to the war. Yeah, yeah. When... So Logo has some stats in there, like how how much the the French caught up with with German production and overtook them. It's quite interesting, and I I wrote this down because this this I, I use this for for arguments if people tell me yeah the the Allies did nothing and uh, and the Germans should have waited with starting the war and and then it's like no. The, the Allies were in full rearmament at this point already. And if, if they had waited, then the, the Germans would have faced way more opposition and not less. Because this is, there's some people out there that think, oh, no, German techno technology superiority and something. Yeah, mm. it's, it's a bit too simplistic. What, what, I, what I just thought about, could it be that the French um, radio industry was rather in bad shape or that the they weren't particularly strong because I know the German radio ele electrical engineering industry was rather good. And for instance, one reason why the Germans used so many um, motorbikes instead of, of trucks or cars was because they had a very good motorbike industry, motorcycle, sorry, motorcycle industry. Mm -hmm. And and so they produced a lot of those, the Skratschützen. Because yeah, they had way more output than for for the for trucks and for cars. So I, maybe it, it was a limitation also in in industri industrial capacity that the the French had very limited radio stuff. That's a good question. I don't actually know much about the state of French radio industry in that period. Um, I would imagine. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to make any uh, uh, guesses since, frankly, I just don't know. But certainly. You know, it could have been a combination of just the French maybe not having the radio, but certainly within the army doctrine, like radios just were not um, as emphasized um, yeah. as it was with the Germans. And, and you know, on a, if there's one thing you can credit Guderian for, you know, because I, I believe he sort of came from like the signal. Corps, yeah, yeah, he came from the signal. Corps, corps. Yeah. So it, his big contribution really is the, the use of the radio, the reliance on it. Um, but again, like even if the French had radios, the, you know, the, the, some of their tanks, the the, the 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 human factor designs are just so horrendous. You know, that that's the other thing that's sort of interesting with, with World War II, how long it took them to figure out like the ideal. And I think that's why World War II tanks are so interesting for me. Like I find them more interesting than than modern tanks, frankly. Um, even though I sort of try to stay knowledgeable about all of it. 
they're still figuring out like these sort of basic questions, you know, in World War II, of, like what's the ideal crew arrangement? What's the, 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 the ideal layout, you know, sort of, you know, you look at modern tanks, it's like modern cars. Everybody sort of figured out. Yeah. You know, it's like all the same nowadays. That's how I feel about like, I mean, uh, the, the, the best example I think is, um, post-war Soviet tanks. I mean, I love, I love World War II Soviet tanks. The T-34, the KV-1, the KV-2, they all look very different. And the mm -hmm. T-26, and, and then you have the T-54, 55, and everyone has this weird dome-shaped like turret. Or not weird, <laughs> very, very extremely boring for me, dome-shaped like turret. And basically everyone has it. It's like, okay, yeah, Soviet tanks slash Russian tanks now. For me, they're like, uh, yeah, I, I really, they're interesting, but they look basically yeah. exactly the same. And I think this comes from them because they have figured out the basics. And yeah, that, that's about it. There's not very, very much to do here. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, I mean, I can tell the difference between a T-80 and a T-72 and a T-64 if I see one. But don't ask me, like, the sub-designations. Yeah. The T-70, there's so many different ones. And, you know, some of the other guys in the forums are really into the, the more modern Soviet stuff, and they can figure that out. And they, they tend to be um, European or, you know, Russian, so they're probably just more interested in that. And, you know, it's funny because they complain that, like, they don't understand U.S. post-war tank development, which to me seems fairly straightforward, but, you know, maybe it's not, you know. <laughs> but um, ironically, you know, it's funny. I was going back and looking and going, okay, what was the first tank to sort of get right the very basics? So the first tank where it's like, okay, they figured out you should have a driver in the hull, three men in the crew, engine and transmission in the rear. Like, just that basic layout, which is pretty much all modern tanks, other, you know, other than ones that use autoloaders or some goofy things like the Merkava. The first tank I can figure out that actually had that arrangement is the Matilda. <laughs> which is funny because you don't think of it as a particularly modern tank even for its era but um, and it was sort of an accident because the British built it and realized they couldn't it wasn't wide enough they couldn't fit a whole machine gunner in it what, so they what, sort of they was it the Matilda stung. 1 or 2? the 2 Matilda 2 I ah okay well, yeah you know oh. it's, and it's not like the British even realized like oh that's actually like sort of the ideal crew layout because all their cruiser tanks that came afterwards, they had all sorts of silly things. Like they're still putting whole machine gun turrets on those early cruisers in 1940. So, but you know, it was just the thing I was like, okay, what was the first tank that actually had that layout? And it was like, Oh, Matilda, that's kind of funny. Um, Cause there are some very good aspects of British tank design in world war two. That's what's so frustrating about the British. The British had figured out a lot of stuff, you know, like them and the Germans are the only two in the thirties that really figured out you have to have a three man crew for a turret in, in your sort of medium tanks, you know, everybody else is still goofing around with one and two man turrets, you know? And so, you know, the British had figured out quite a few things, but they just never, they just never able to pull it all together and do something yeah. that's actually good until, you know, 19, the, you know, the end of the war, finally, when they come out with, you know, Comet and then Centurion, it's, it's, it's such a frustrating thing, you know, but also you have to realize, you know, in terms of development timeframes, you know, World War II is only seven years total. I mean, there's a lot of, like, like I said, the Char B-1 BIS, that thing was in development for over a decade, you know, before it hit production. So, you know, it, you, you look at development during World War II, and it's, if you don't already have stuff that you're already working on, you're not going to get it out in time. Yeah. The end of the war, you know. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize that when they, when they, they, they don't understand how complex these machines are, how long it takes to develop it, and then also how long it takes to set up the assembly lines. Yeah, yeah. This is, I, I don't know the numbers actually for tanks, but for, for planes, I think it was like up to five years with the whole mm -hmm. development cycle. And, and people are like, just, yeah, the message from me 262, you just, it was just came too late because Hitler delayed it. No, he didn't delay it. It <laughs> couldn't just get, go faster. This is complete new technology, guys. It's not like, yeah, the first prototype flew back then. Yeah, the prototype. And mm -hmm. the engine worked like for, I don't know, five hour, hours or something. And back yeah. then they had still heat resistant material to go with. They didn't have that then later on. And so, so it's like people sometimes, it's not a computer game. You don't click on research no. and then 
okay, it's done and now I can produce it. Yeah, and setting up the assembly lines and everything. It's it's insane. I also I think you know that the data from from Adam Two's in Wages of Destruction for the for the one hundred nine like the the production efficiency it, it just go, goes up with every month basically. But if you put it in first in production, it's just nothing's gonna happen <laughs> mostly. Yeah. Or then you retool your your assembly line, and this takes several weeks or months sometimes. It's not like you just click there and and it happens. Yeah, I mean the 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 thing you see again and again with the Germans in World War Two, it's not that they're delaying introducing; they're introducing stuff too soon. You know, yeah. Um, you certainly see that with the tanks. I mean, the Panther at Kursk is sort of the classic example. I mean, when you have vehicles that are setting themselves on fire, there's there's a problem there. Yeah. There be, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, it, at the same time, it's you know they're in the middle of a war. You want to get this stuff out there you know, as quick as possible. Uh, but but yeah, some of that. Uh, but yeah, the German World War II tank production and design and policy. It's there were some odd decisions. That's all I'll say. It's a uh, uh, you know, there's some technical brilliance. There's some really innovative designs, but you know. Sometimes you sort of have to shake your head at like the decisions, like why you know. And again, a lot of it's made out of desperation. The one you know, one stat uh, off on another tangent. The one stat that's always sort of when I first saw it, like just I, I my jaw almost dropped. German tank production for 1945 was higher than German tank production for 1941. Yeah, I think that's pretty much. Uh, I, I can't confirm it, but it, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, if you just go to like the Wikipedia page for like World I, War II Germany, they, they have I, a chart. I, and I've looked at other sources because they were just like, "Hey, 1941, we're going to win in Russia. We don't need more tanks." Yeah, yeah, they, they were they switching to to Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine production at this point. Yeah. yeah, and but there was also, I think, wait, there's some some important point. But an, another aspect was that at this point they switched to the production around, so. Like if you look at, at 1939 and 1941, the number of tanks is basically similar, but basically most of the Panzer ones and Panzer twos are out of service, or yeah. to a large degree. So and and if you look how many Panzer threes and forty had in 1939, it was basically a handful, and and so they also produced less because yeah they had this point. And I assume that for 1945, there are quite many. Um, Jagdpanzer 38T probably in there, mm -hmm. the Hetzer, oh, yeah. which is way it's which is very cheap to produce in comparison to everything else, and also likely uh, quite many Sturks, which is also a lot of experience with the Panzer III, so with the whole production lines, and probably also dependent on they had only one one tank factory, which actually quite near from here, which had an assembly line. There was only one, and it was St. Yeah. Valentin near Linz, but this was an an end production facility. So if something didn't ship up there, they couldn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, and by 1945 too, I mean, it was, it was in 44 that Hitler implemented the sort of panzer program prioritizing the tank Adolf production. Hitler panzer program. I think it's over 1943, I think. I'm not entirely 40, sure. It probably, I think you're right. And, you know, so, because that's the other thing, looking in the, in the early part of the war, tank production is was not a high priority. Yeah. Certainly not compared to airplanes, you know. I remember looking at a chart that just sort of did, you know, production by category, and I was sort of shocked at how little resources were being put toward tank yeah. production. Um, this was most people don't know. They think, like, okay, they won, and they put everything in panzers. No, they did, didn't for quite some time. Only with the Adolf Hitler panzer program, I think, then it started, yeah. Before it was, yeah, they're important or kind of, yeah. So, you know, and also I just, I, I was sort of shocked that they were able to produce really anything in 1945 to be honest i mean you think about the the this the, the situation at that point but you know i guess those factories just kept going up until they literally were occupied so. yeah yeah basically I've, 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 didn't, somebody mentioned this i think was it was it shifted or somebody who mentioned yeah i mean you you work till mm -hmm. somebody tells you to stop because usually you're yeah. paid and and it's also the thing i mean the People probably don't realize this. If there's a war going on and people around are dying or you don't know what's going on, to keep you occupied, you probably just go through the motions and do your work because it also, mm -hmm. it, it's the same. I, I noticed from, from psychological studies, as far as I remember, I remember, 
if you're in pain, physical pain or something, and you don't have anything to do, it's way worse from your experience than you just have something to do to occupy yourself. So I wouldn't be surprised if, 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 and maybe at this point, people who are just not paying attention to where, where the front line is or they just go to the factory, do their job, get the, especially it could also be that they get um, paid in rations. Mm -hmm. And if you're getting paid in food rations, you pretty sure show up for work. Yeah. Well, you have, you know, let's say you have way more motivation than, than if you get a paycheck somewhere down the line at the end of the month. Yeah. And also just the fact that a lot of these guys probably wouldn't even know. I mean, if the allies are 10 miles from their factory, yeah. it's not like, you know, not that they can go home and turn on the TV and, 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 and Goebbels is giving, be, giving you know, updates or the allies are only 10 miles away. And like, no, I don't, I don't think that's how it works. So, you know, communications, I'm sure in, in media, you know, particularly in a, in, a, in a dictatorship like that, you know, unless you're, you're in a world of word of mouth, you're not even going to know what the, the, the bigger situation is probably. Yeah. Um, it would, it would be interesting that, you know, I wonder if anybody's ever interviewed German civilians at that point, sort of be like, well, you know, was it just you woke up one day and you're like, good Lord, there's allied forces coming into our town, you know, or I mean, I'm not they, sure they were, were fleeing to a certain degree, but uh, in 1945 to a certain degree, where you're going to flee to at, at, yeah. at certain points or, or what, what you don't want to trust. I, I don't know if they prevented fleeing mm -hmm. as far as I know not, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, I think it's a situation we can't really, or it's pretty hard to, to put ourselves into those shoes because I mean, the communication situation now is completely different. And then also they had a war going on for, for several years. They were bombed. They were, uh, I, I mean, some people would probably point out, yeah, but you, if, if the troops are near, you probably could hear artillery. Yeah. Can you tell the difference between an, an AA gun firing and an artillery as a regular civilian? Mm, likely not. Yeah, it's, I'm sure, an incredibly chaotic and fluid situation. I think we can all be happy that it's the one we didn't have to experience, that's for sure. Uh, total sidetrack. As, as, as an American with, um, of, of Polish ancestry, in my mom's whole family, they came over from Poland in, in, uh, around the turn of the century through Ellis Island. And my great-grandmother was still alive when I was a kid and, and lived in a house with no running water up until like the 1980s and always had an outhouse, you know, and my parents used to always talk about like, Oh my God, you know, like there's a so old country and so poor. And, you know, the more I read about world war one and world war two and what their life would have been if they had not come over here, it's like probably that simple house in Pink County, Michigan with an outhouse, heck of a lot better than being stuck between, you know, the, the Soviet the, the union German. and Germany. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's the whole, the, the whole, there's the book, uh, the, what is it, Blood? Oh. Bloodlands? Uh, Bloodlands, yeah. You know, that one, I was reading that going, thank God great grandma and grandpa got on that boat because you just pull into that period, not a good thing. So, anyway, long sidetrack from tanks, just a little <laughs> bit of my own personal history. You know, as far as the materials that are out there, it's interesting. Like, there's, um, like I said, as far as doctrine and tactics, there's, there's the, 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 the Doty book. As, as far as books specifically on tanks, like I said, you've got the four Zaloga Osprey things. So he did the, the two-volume New Vanguard, French tanks of World War II, volumes one and two. Then you've got the two dual books that he did, you know, Panzer III versus S-35. This is B-1 Bis. And then, you know, there's there's some older stuff, like really old stuff, like the old um, AFE profile books from the 70s, which... Yeah, and then there's like the track story ones, which there's there's a few of those, but yeah, they're expensive, um, and they're in both French and English, and, uh, and the French and the English translation is a little wonky in those, to be honest. Um, I would say thank you very much for this talk, and be sure to check out his channel. I will link it in the description, also in in the end screen. So and so, thank you very much, Tom. Oh, thank you, um, uh, and thanks for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, people, check out the channel. It's uh, e the topic sort of sort of like this talk. It kind of goes all over. It's just about tanks, but you never know what I'm going to post next. I, I, th I think the next video I might do is going to be on the MBT-70 and the T-64. So we'll see. Excellent. All right. See you. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye.